speaking with Professor Frederick Hayden of the University of Virginia, who at this meeting gave a great summary of the status of anti-influenza virus antiviral. So I thought we could chat about it a bit. So thanks for sitting down with me. Great pleasure to be I here. I heard you speak in Switzerland about this two years ago, and uh, that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you back at this meeting as well. Oh, well, thank you. So the, the arsenal of antivirals against influenza is relatively small compared to, say, HIV. Do we know why that is? Well, it's certainly growing. Uh, you know, historically, we've had two classes of antiviral drugs, mm -hmm. starting with the mantidine and then subsequently rimantidine and the M2 inhibitor group. And then in the 1990s, saw the development of the neuraminidase inhibitors, which came into clinical practice in 1999. But the reality is that our options are relatively limited currently. And I'm not sure all the reasons why there hasn't been greater interest in developing influenza antivirals, but I suspect it, it, it's multiple factors, uh, perhaps uh, including the lack of perceived commercial opportunity, uh, perhaps the, the false assumption that influenza isn't a treatable condition, uh, and that, uh, uh, that there's really not the need to provide mm -hmm. uh, specific therapy for influenza patients, particularly those with underlying conditions or who have severe or progressive illness. I wondered if it had anything to do with the fact that there's a very good influenza vaccine, and that is preferable to, to be used than antivirals in most cases, right? Well, certainly prevention is our primary means mm -hmm. of um, trying to mitigate the impact of influenza, and it has been for, for many decades. But really, antivirals are a complementary approach to uh, vaccines, because recall that of course, not everybody gets immunized currently. Right. Uh, there are some seasons when there's a relatively poor match, and the vaccines are incomplete protective, particularly in some of our high-risk populations, so that there's certainly a complementary role for antiviral treatment, and in some cases, even antiviral prophylaxis in, in very high-risk patients who may not respond uh, to our current vaccines. So you mentioned that the, the arsenal is growing. Uh, so we have, as you mentioned, two targets at the moment for intervention. The ion channel, and the neuraminidase. So what are some of the new targets? Well, the new targets include uh, the viral polymerase, uh, mm -hmm. also the virus interaction with the, with the host cell uh, surface receptor. So right. there's actually an interesting molecule that's a uh, sialidase, which destroys the receptor recognized by viral mm -hmm. hemagglutinin. Now, those two uh, targets are still uh, in investigational development in terms of the antiviral drugs. Uh, but they're, they're, in fact, in uh, mid-level uh, clinical mm -hmm. development currently, and we wait with interest really to see the results of the phase two, and in one case, uh, phase three studies that are ongoing with those specific uh, antiviral drugs to see whether they, in fact, will ultimately prove effective uh, as single therapies. The other thing that's important about these kinds of uh, agents with novel mechanisms, of course, is that they're active against viruses that are resistant to our current uh, classes of antiviral drugs and so that they would provide an, an, either an alternative therapy or one that which could be used in combinations to try to either enhance antiviral effect or uh, prevent resistance emergence. But all of this, of course, remains to be determined. If we did have multiple targets and drugs approved and available to treat influenza, would it be more routine to use a combination of of drugs to avoid resistance, as we do with HIV? Well, it certainly makes sense in certain patient populations. Mm -hmm. We know uh, from a lot of experience, now, including that accrued during the, the recent pandemic of H1N1, mm -hmm. that uh, certainly our immunosuppressed patient populations are at high risk for having emergence of drug-resistant variants. And in some studies, as many as half of of uh, highly uh, immunocompromised patients had emergence of oseltamivir resistance mm -hmm. uh, when they were treated for their acute in influenza illness. So using combinations in those kinds of uh, patient populations, also in trying to rapidly control viral replication in those who have more severe illness uh, or who uh, have uh, high-risk underlying conditions would make a lot of mm -hmm. sense. And there, are, there, there have been, in fact, um, uh, preclinical studies that have gone on for uh, over three decades with regard to uh, various uh, combinations of our older drugs, which include the ones like the M2 inhibitors, uh, ribavirin, which is still investigational as an anti-influenza drug uh, in this country, 
uh, mm -hmm. and more recently the, the neuraminidase inhibitors. And some of these are, are quite promising in terms of uh, their activity either in vitro or in animal models to show uh, uh, synergistic activity in some uh, circumstances, but there's been a, a really a very limited amount of, of human testing so far. Mm -hmm. uh, the one study that, that has been completed to date uh, was uh, a small one where we compared the activity of uh, the M2 inhibitor rimantidine uh, with a, uh, a, a saline placebo to inhaled, or in this case nebulized, zanamivir uh, with rimantidine in a hospitalized patient cohort. And although the study was under-enrolled, it did suggest that, in fact, the combination could reduce the likelihood of resistance emergence to the M2 inhibitor, it's consistent with you know, mm -hmm. other work that comes from other uh, antiviral mm. in, uh, fields as well. So that uh, I, I'm hoping as, as we look forward that there will be the opportunity to look at combination therapy, particularly immunocompromised host and in hospitalized patients. But in, in terms of the recent developments, the uh, most uh, uh, exciting news really comes from the study of, of the intravenous neuraminidase inhibitors. And uh, these agents we, we know can provide high levels of the drug in a in reliable, uh, rapid fashion. And it's hoped that that would then translate into greater antiviral effects and potentially greater clinical benefits, particularly, again, in, in more seriously ill patients. And those studies that are, are ongoing at present with uh, both uh, intravenous uh, paramivir, mm -hmm. at, uh, which was recently approved, mm -hmm. by the way, uh, in uh, uh, both Japan and South Korea, and intravenous uh, zanamivir. And there are also some studies with uh, intravenous oseltamivir to uh, uh, really fill out the full right. range of neuraminidase inhibitors. So these are for particularly ill individuals who are hospitalized? Well, right? in, in, in fact, uh, in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, the data that have been uh, accrued with intravenous paramivir uh, have been done initially in outpatients, where they looked at single mm -hmm. uh, doses given intravenously compared to, uh, in, in the first instance, placebo, where it was clearly mm -hmm. superior, and then subsequently to uh, a standard five-day course of oseltamivir. Mm -hmm where they look comparable. Uh, so that, uh, that that's a possibility, although I, you know, I think that really, from my perspective, I see these drugs as being particularly important for our high-risk patients and those, again, who have more serious illness sure. coming to hospital. Routine administration by IV is probably not going to be very popular in the U.S. anyway. Well, especially when we have alternatives that can sure. either be given orally or by uh, yeah. inhalation. And, and th there's another uh, investigational neuraminidase inhibitor called lanonamivir, mm -hmm. uh, which has, again, been recently approved in, in Japan, which ha appears to have a long duration of activity in the respiratory tract. And so, again, that agent, uh, given uh, in a single inhalation uh, on the, uh, w in patients coming in with, with uncomplicated flu, look comparable mm -hmm. to a uh, five-day regimen uh, of right. oseltamivir, in, in, at least in the studies uh, uh, that have been uh, presented to date, so that uh, there's further work going on with that, that agent as well. So it looks that we will have, uh, assuming that these drugs progress uh, and, and ultimately become uh, approved by the regulatory authorities here in the United States and in Europe, that we'll have some interesting uh, alternatives looking, uh, look, looking forward. What's the timeline? A few years, and then we should know the results of these? I, I'm really not sure about that. I, I, yeah. I know that there, you know, the phase three studies uh, of paramivir are ongoing right now. Uh, they're about ready to start with IV zanamivir, and I, and I believe that they're uh, expected to, to, mm -hmm. to be launched soon with the inhaled uh, lanonamivir uh, neuraminidase inhibitor that I mentioned. Uncomplicated influenza in a healthy individual, typically, though, one drug, four or five day regimen. Is, is the routine. There's no need to give combinations to those individuals. Well, in fact, though, for low-risk individuals mm -hmm. who have uncomplicated disease, um, it, it's not essential to give them antivirals. It, it's really based on the discretion of the uh, clinician uh, and uh, the assessment of the severity of that illness because, again, the, the uh, registrational trials specifically focused on patients with with febrile influenza illness. Yeah. So it makes no sense to treat someone who has a, a, a mild uh, influenza uh, yeah. syndrome hmm. uh, because it's not clear that they would, they would benefit. But we do know now with further data that's uh, been accrued during the, the pandemic uh, that uh, early treatment that's within mm -hmm. 
the first day or two of symptom onset does have uh, benefits with regard to reducing virus replication uh, and reducing symptoms, mm -hmm. perhaps reducing the likelihood of transmission of that virus to close contacts, although right. the results there are not definitive, and it also appears to reduce the likelihood of complications. And there's one mm -hmm. uh, study that's uh, in press right now from China where they found a, a significant reduction uh, with early treatment on the mm -hmm. likelihood of getting radiographically documented uh, pneumonia. So that uh, these kinds of data seem to uh, confirm some earlier findings that we saw in, in seasonal influence and, and are, support the, the concept that, that when someone is seeking medical care with, with febrile influenza, and they can be treated mm -hmm. early, and there's a, a sufficient drug availability that it, uh, that treatment uh, can benefit them. It seemed like last year during the pandemic emergence of novel H1N1 that there was more also Tamivir use than you would normally see seasonally, perhaps because there was some fear of the virulence of the virus. You think that's correct? Well, I, I, there was, uh, to my knowledge, certainly increased use globally of, yeah. of uh, uh, the neuromidase inhibitors, particularly uh, oseltamivir, and, and part of this uh, uh, may have been related to uh, the uncertainty regarding the severity uh, of the in in infection uh, mm -hmm. early on. Because as you recall, the initial reports emanating from Mexico certainly suggest that there was a right. substantial risk of severe disease in, the, in these virulent viral pneumonias leading to death in, in previously healthy mm -hmm. uh, young adults in, in some uh, unfortunate circumstances. Uh, in, in we now have some information about global use, but it, it concentrated as it has historically uh, in, in Japan, which has had the highest per capita use of, of the neuromidase inhibitors uh, in the world and, and in the United States. Uh, the WHO actually uh, released its uh, stockpiles of, of uh, oseltamivir for use in uh, less resource countries. And, mm -hmm. and we're still waiting to see the, the data accrue with regard to really how extensive uh, drug use was uh, globally, but it d did seem to go up in, in, the, in the pandemic mm -hmm. context. Right. And, and I think it made a real difference with regard to um, the uh, severity of illness in many patients who, who in fact did have access to early treatment. And, and more importantly, uh, there some evidence that has now uh, been accumulated to suggest that even somewhat delayed treatment in mm -hmm. those who coming into hospital uh, made a difference in terms of their likelihood of progressing to more severe outcomes, right. such as ICU admission uh, or, or uh, uh, mortality. I have one more question because I know you want to hear the ICAC lecture, and that is the seasonal H1N1 strains eventually became globally oseltamivir resistant. Mm -hmm. and. The new 2009 H1N1 is not there, but it looks like eventually it will also become resistant. If that's the case, what do we do? Well, I'm not sure your premise is correct that it will become <laughs> resistant at a global level. We've, mm -hmm. To date, we've seen primarily uh, sporadic, geographically uh, dispersed uh, uh, you know, resistance detections in, in the mm -hmm. number, really, in terms of the total number of, of the of isolates that have been screened for resistance to oseltamivir is, is, is small. It's less than 2%. Even in a country like Japan, which had quite extensive oseltamivir use, and interesting also, uh, the lowest associated uh, uh, mortality uh, during the pandemic mm -hmm. of, of countries that re recorded those statistics, uh, had only about 1% of over uh, 6,000 community isolates that had oseltamivir resistance. Now, having said that, I don't think we should be too reassured that we might not see the same phenomenon as we saw with seasonal mm -hmm. uh, H1N1, because when some of these resistant viruses have been looked at in the laboratory, they appear fully replication competent and transmissible uh, in laboratory models uh, of influenza. And we've also seen instances, certainly, uh, in, in uh, high-risk patient populations mm -hmm. of protracted replication in immunocompromised host, even when the drug has been taken away to su suggest that the viruses are, are quite fit. They can certainly cause severe disease uh, and, e and be associated with fatal outcomes in some of these individuals. And importantly, we've also seen then several clusters now of resistant variants right. being right. transmitted, including uh, one in, in the community. So I think it, it clearly says that even though we haven't seen widespread 
or sustained community transmission to date that uh, we can't be reassured that it won't happen in the future and we certainly need to be vigilant about that yeah, possibility sure. going forward. We'll see. It's hard to predict viral evolution. Indeed. Thanks for talking with me. I appreciate your time. Great pleasure.